Welcome everybody to the Planning Commission podcast. Today's episode, knock knock. <laughs> Who's, Who's there? there? <laughs> Commissioner. Commissioner who? Commissioner who clearly did not read their damn packet. <laughs> <laughs> Our special guest today is Nate Hood, St. Paul, Minnesota Planning Commissioner and stand-up comedian. The Planning Commission podcast is a spirited discussion with myself and a couple of my longtime colleagues in the profession. Our discussions are based solely on our own opinions and do not reflect the opinions or views of our employers, the American Planning Association, or even our alma maters. So grab a seat in the back of City Hall, dig out an old copy of Robert's Rules, and for goodness sakes, read your packet. The Planning Commission is now in session. All right. First of all, let's start off with a roll call. Commissioner Smith? Present. And Commissioner Koslick? Present, but and on not much sleep. Well, yeah, yeah well, I didn't know that was required for this podcast. <laughs> physically here, mentally, we'll see. Remains to be seen. All right, today, Commissioner our, Danley. Yeah, I'm here. I think oh, okay, it's obvious, okay. but <laughs> let's move forward with our agenda today. Discussion item: the whiskey pairing. The interview with Mr. Hood, who can't wait in the lightning run, lightning round. Um, can't wait. Also, just to let you know, please head up our website www.theplanningcommissionpodcast.com. Go check it out, YouTube channel, Amazon, Apple, Spotify, Deezer, Carrier Pigeon, and all the other ways that, that we try to get our information out there. So, commissioners, can I get in a motion to approve today's agenda? So moved. All right, Second. cool. Let's jump into it. Today, we are going to talk all about how to be a good commissioner, how to have a good meeting, what the public can do to be good you know test provide good testimony we'll talk about staff reports and holy cow we just had one the other day that was mm, rough <laughs> but nevertheless we we got through it and all the other elements of what goes into hopefully a really good commission meeting so my first question before we get to the whiskey pairing is what is your most memorable moment that you've ever had as part of an official meeting planning and zoning, city council, something similar. Think about that. Ponder it, ponder it. I'll give you mine just so that you have a little more time mm -hmm. to think about it. My first go around as a P&Z commissioner several years ago, we had an application for a piece of ground next to what's called in, in Boise, the Shakespeare Festival. Many communities have a version of that, right? Well, the application was to turn a chunk of ground into basically a bunch of homes and the homes were close enough to the, the Shakespeare Festival that folks were paranoid that if those homes were going to be built, the noise complaints would ultimately shut down what is a pretty incredible venue. And so what did we have? Man, did we have a big turnout that night. And a normal chamber of about eh, 50 to 75 was completely opened up to probably three or 400. We had people who came in with sound systems that were brought, that were, <laughs> were putting on Shakespearean plays via <laughs> the speakers that was just bouncing around the chambers and basically depicting what they were afraid of. And so we had this incredible moment. And I'm just like, holy cow right this is a surreal in, in moment and we had kids crying and a whole nine and that's tough right when you have a little kid crying in front of you as a commissioner you're just like oh my god i'm gonna break this kid's heart right Ear, their ears them. are bleeding <laughs> right. go go back oh. though you said something that i thought it sounded like a magical meeting you had you have 50 to 75 people attend a planning commission meeting I would say most nights um, are, are most of the nights that we have our meeting. We have the chambers is set up. The chambers is set up to achieve two things. One is a typical meeting. One is a hey, overflow and it hope, you know, uh -huh. all that. Our typical meeting. Oh, yeah, we'll have, I don't know, sometimes 50, 75 to 100. Now, obviously, they're not there typically for this one, one, one issue, but huh. could be could certainly we have had that. 
Um, so yeah, I would say we actually do pretty well with people coming and testifying. Well, I mean, how many did you guys have with the homeless shelter discussion? That was, I mean, that was totally opened up and there were hundreds and hundreds. We had 16 hours of testimony <laughs> for that hearing, which was the only time a I've ever seen relocation that many... of a shelter. <laughs> the only time I've ever seen that many people at a public meeting in Alaska was like, um, I just, I can't think of a time. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all right. That's all good. But yeah, I guess we're doing all right. People are paying attention and, you know. Well, we're busy. You know. We got things to do out here. <laughs> <laughs> Not us. We just sit around and you know, by golly, we're going to go down to City Hall and we're going to fight the hell out of that CUP. So anyway, Don, Jess, what is your most memorable well, moment? The most memorable one I have, just the thing that comes to mind the first, and I don't even know what this was about, but um, when I was on staff, at the Matsu Borough, there I remember this particular planning commission meeting, and I think I remember what the issue was, but it just I can't remember what everybody's um, angst was about it. I could guess, but I'm not going to do that. Um, but I was told I was we kind of had this frequent flyer that would come in and and uh, you know always give um, testimony on how we weren't following the public process yeah, in, yeah. In, in their mind. <laughs> that does happen. It happened a lot. We every time it was amazing. He, always did and they always mm -hmm. did their time but it was so funny because when this person came up and gave their um public testimony they pointed right at me right i'm an ex officio oh, member of the yes, planning yes, commission yes, 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 yes. and says you should resign this is you so should. bad you get should out of quit Alaska. your job <laughs> yeah what are you thinking how can you sleep at night and do this job yeah. and i'm like i mean yeah there's like yeah. 12 planning jobs here. I was going to take one. But, you know, and and I remember thinking um, the only reason I can keep this job is because I, I you know, I do realize this is not, um, this is not, this is okay. Like what we're trying to do here is, is actually for the greater good of the community. At least you're getting paid to be there. I know for us <laughs> commissioners, we get paid squat and get accused of taking money all over the place. So. Oh yeah. Oh, <laughs> At least yeah. you were on the public payroll. So. <laughs> well, and that was also something was always, you know, kind of common. It was the the folks that would come up to the microphone and say, yeah. you know, I pay your salary. And I'm oh, like, yes, we yes, don't yes. pay taxes here. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Taxes. That's um, Alaska. you do pay a little bit of property tax out here, but I mean, I'm going to yeah. tell you right I'm now. I'm funded by BP and Shell. So don't, <laughs> you know. All right. What do you got, Don Webb? You've been around a few different cities and a few different capacities. I was uh, one of the first pedestrian plans I did as a consultant was in Banner Elk, North Carolina. And if you don't know Banner Elk, North Carolina, Banner it's Elk. up it's Banner up in the mountains Elk. and a lot of Banner. retired people there with a lot of time on their hands. And so we were there for the adoption of this plan. And apparently the week before, the commission had had a pretty heated discussion. And one commissioner had made a claim that turned out not to be true. I forget the topic. So... We were first up on the agenda after adoption of the minutes, and I was still sitting there three hours later because they had still failed to adopt the minutes from oh, the prior God. meeting because <laughs> they were all up in arms that this claim that one of the commissioners had made that wasn't true shouldn't go in the minutes because it wasn't true. Mm. And the discussion was around, well, it still happened. <laughs> it still should be in the minutes. So, and, and like this town had not called in their contract attorney for like months, but all of a sudden he's there for this stuff. <laughs> and they're going back and forth. And this lady, a retiree, got him and said, I used to be the parliamentarian for the South Carolina legislature. And this is the biggest BS we've ever seen and blah, 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 blah. And after three hours, they finally determined that, yes, it should go in the minutes. And in this oh week's minutes, God. we can correct the misstatement from the past week. And then we finally, lovely, and it was funny lovely. because I never knew a pedestrian plan could clear out the room so fast because there was nobody <laughs> left in the audience yeah. by the time yours we got was to easy. that. Yeah, yours is easy. Oh my God. Yeah, very good. So That's I'm going to turn it to the whiskey pairing in just a second, but I would be remiss if I, I as it just occurred to me, uh, another memory. So when Don and I worked together at the good old highway district here locally, I think I was maybe six months into the job still i mean i was still wet behind the ear kind of a thing you know and i get sent but out But you still had your coffee maker i yeah well maybe that's why you sent me so he sent me <laughs> out to a, a city council meeting 
at a, at a city who was having huge issues with great big development pressures. And we were the entity that represented the roadways in the system. We know it's a, a unique situation. And we were neutral, right? But they were looking to us for guidance on how to handle all this development and whether or not the roadway system could absorb what was being proposed. So here comes Chris with this little letter that was written by Don. The district is not for or against and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, that's good, right? I can go home now. <laughs> oh no, there were follow-up questions. Well, wait a minute. What do you, I mean, we need your input. Oh crap. Um, the district is not for or against, oh, hung out to dry by Commissioner Kostelik six months into the gig. And I think the next day he was just laughing his ass off, just kind of going, yeah, well, you know, that's what, that's what it takes to grow into this profession of planning. So thank you. I, I appreciate it. I need to bring yeah. like every employee I've ever had on here and I want to give them the grace to just tell me weird stuff. Like oh, I, dumb stuff I did like that. Yeah. What kind of a, yeah. Yeah. Kind of a manager are you? <laughs> All, All right, right. Let's, Commissioner let's Danley, our, you got the I whiskey pairing ideas. This, I love it. Yeah, yeah. This is going to be. This is hitting so many notes. It's great. All right, so our episode is all about again, Commissioner. Read your packet. Be prepared. Right. As commissioners, what do we like to think of ourselves as? Hmm. The boss. Oh. Yep. What is Commissioner Kosalik's favorite? 80s television show with a character that might also think he is also named the come boss, on go ahead ha, boss, boss. <laughs> the you dukes of I'm hazard going? you see where i'm going with this today's whiskey pairing Woo. is brought to you by and i have to show it because i don't own a bottle of this not only is this <laughs> the boss stuff, hog <laughs> if you can read this if you're reading it it's yeah, called a little too close <laughs> uh siren's song now why is that relevant let me read this to you because i think of us as the boss aren't we in the boss of course mm -hmm. we're the boss at least in our own podcast we're the and boss, we right? all like to hog the airwaves 100 <laughs> percent. the siren's song is an odyssey of maturation a twice finished well-aged <laughs> rye with no. which slumbered in cakes seasoned in greek fig nectar i don't even know what the oh, heck wow. all that is greek greece is the home of democracy, right? Yes, yeah. Okay, so not is only <laughs> is that getting better, wait a minute, here is the best part. Keeping their, this legendary liquid under cork are nine bespoke pewter mm. toppers, each representing one of the ancient Greek muses. So what are we saying? Whistlepig has nine toppers in this particular run of Siren's song, right? One of them is called Thalia, and Thalia is the muse of comedy. Hi. <laughs> I mean, I have, I even have a picture of it, but you know, this but is. But we one need of the five other, of the toppers to get a quorum. This is one of the other <laughs> toppers. You get the idea. Now, have I ever had it? No. Why? It's oh, really? at least it's at least six hundred dollars a bottle, <laughs> and in some cases, it's like you know. 11 12 13 so you're not getting grand. that on your planning commissioner stipend. and oh by the way they're encouraging you to you buy all nine. Oh, so, of course <laughs> then i haven't drank that whistle pig i thought if, i had but that is if, wrong <laughs> if you've got nine you want to buy nine two grand bottles just to get the little pewter top man good on you but nevertheless it's you know hopefully someday we'll have an excuse i thought that would be about as good of a whiskey pairing that was great as as we can find for our guest yeah. nate hood who again is a is a commissioner and stand-up comedian and it's time for utter us to introduce him now uh nate matehood thank you for joining us on the planning commission podcast it's a pleasure to have you Hey, thanks for having me on here. And uh, you spent a little too much time thinking about that whiskey pairing intro. I have. <laughs> guilty, guilty. We always yeah. spend way too much time thinking about our best. Don't go back pairing. and listen to the one on zoning and its history. So. Well, if we're ever going to self aggrandize ourselves about what we do, it's going to be this episode, right? I mean, we are the <laughs> bees knees, so to speak. Nate, tell us a little bit about you, your background, how you became a commissioner, and certainly how the heck did you get into stand up comedy? Yeah, thanks. So uh, my name's Nate. I'm a dad husband. I, I work as a professional planner. I'm on my local planning commission and I moonlight 
as a stand-up comic, you usually try to get out there one night a week, uh, the more the merrier, but I do have two little kids, which um, usually shows me just at like the bedtime routine. So anytime I do a show, like I got to make it up to my wife somehow because putting two little kids to bed is <laughs> not always easy. How old are they, by the way? <laughs> one and five. Oh, oh yeah. Still doing diapers. Trenches. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> but at least they, they got to provide you lots of material, right? Yeah, a little bit of material. My wife's like, you know, be careful on that. Yeah, like <laughs> just because. Uh, but yeah, yeah, a little bit of material. Uh, my my eldest daughter has provided uh, audiences with lots of laughs. So <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> so so how did how know. did you get into this though? I mean, you're so you're a stand you're a stand up by by night, but you're also trained as a planner. Um, tell I us am, real yeah. quickly though, how did you get into becoming a commissioner? And then I know Jess can ask you a follow up. Yeah. So. You know, I had a background in planning, uh, moved to my St. Paul neighborhood, and there was an opening on our local district council, which is our version of a neighborhood association. Mm -hmm. So I ran for that, and I was on there for about three, four years. I really just grinded away at just, you know, those, those small little zoning variances where we would offer a recommendation to the planning commission. Uh, then an opening happened on the planning commission. I, I, I wish there was more to the story other than I just applied. <laughs> and uh and i got it and warm body let's go got a point. yeah absolutely um <laughs> you know so so it was really i just started on that low level and then just slowly kind of working my way up to more important uh committees and commissions how long have um, you been on it man i started right before the pandemic i think late summer early fall 2019 so mm -hmm. still most of my most of my experience on the planning commission has been virtual Mm -hmm. um, however, my day to day job, you know, we'll work with various planning commissions, you know, throughout kind of the metro. So I'm very familiar with planning commissions. And now I'm happy that I can consider myself a planning commissioner uh, just personally. So. Well, Nate, I don't know if you can answer this question, like from personal experience, but uh, maybe if you've seen a good planning commissioner somewhere, if you could tell us what makes a good planning commissioner, maybe that's you, maybe it's somebody else. First and foremost, it's somebody who reads the packet before the meeting. I think <laughs> that's the most important thing. Uh, you know, I try not to be For a For goodness thief. sakes, right? <laughs> yeah, I call it, you know, we we oftentimes get new commissioners on and maybe they don't know the ropes, but I they're mm -hmm. oftentimes uh, time thieves where they'll ask questions that are very clearly stated in the packet. Uh, they The staff will generally give us reports prior to any vote or public hearing. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty clear who's paying attention and who's not. So right. I think the, the 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 best thing is care enough to read the packet. Now, sometimes these staff packets, I feel bad for staff, frankly. Sometimes you look at a staff packet and you're like, man, this conditional use permit is 38 pages. Who like, <laughs> you know, at least read the first three, right? They give us a yeah. pretty good executive summary and you know, you can scan through. The first thing that I always do is I look for the map and then I look for the rendering of any building. Those are the first two things I do. And then I, I, I feel bad because I almost formed a judgment based on those two things. Uh, <laughs> but read the staff packet and I think know what we're voting on mm -hmm. and know the issue that we're addressing. I think one of the, the, the faults that many new planning commissioners have is they'll either like or not like a, a certain project mm -hmm. and they'll, they'll try to kill it or approve it on irrelevant facts to the case. Right. Yeah. Most most zoning applications, you're taking a quasi judicial role, which is you are mm -hmm. making a legal recommendation on what needs to get approved. And inexperienced commissioners will just, you know, they'll pull the there's too much traffic or I think yeah. this is a little too high, et cetera. Yeah. And and that's been I thank you for saying that. And the, I think that sometimes um, that happens in our planning commissions. Uh, we forget that this is quasi judicial in most cases, and we're looking for we're looking for you not to do the planning work. That's why we have staff. We we put it together for you. We've made it real easy. What we want you to do is take a look at it from your lens, uh, see if we missed anything relevant and legal, mm -hmm. and and make a decision. We don't have yeah. to. You don't have to redo the planning work that's already been done. We took care of that for yeah. you. So yeah. yeah, that's awesome. That's really great advice. Read your packet and at least read that executive summary. Your staff put that together and uh, pay attention. Pay attention. Yeah. It's, it's the best. <laughs> and, and Nate, to your point too, I think, and this is something, honestly, I, I have to remind myself of once in a while, and that is 
what exactly, what, what type of a decision am I making to your point, I think, which is mm -hmm. if this is a CUP, it's supposed to end with us as P and Z, at least according to yeah. our code yeah. versus mm -hmm. a rezone or whatever, where it's mm -hmm. a recommendation to council. And it really, you really, I think you really do need to put your head in the the space of the council, for example, to kind of mm -hmm. have a sense of what, what are they interested in? Mm -hmm. And if it's in any difference or you're setting them up for success as much as you can, you're making your own decision, but I think recognizing that, Hey, the next, they have a go, they have to go to the next rung of the ladder. Mm -hmm. And so I want to yeah. make sure that it goes well. Well, we've had two planning terms today that, that we don't have on the AICP exam. And you brought up one mate with time thieves. I think that would yeah. be a good one yeah. to delve yeah. into. Yeah. Jess mentioned frequent flyers. What's yeah. been your, what's been your most memorable <laughs> meeting while you've been on the planning commission? You know, I'll tell you my most unremarkable one, my most unmemorable <laughs> one. Uh, the city of St. Paul uh, was one of the first cities and first large cities to remove parking minimums. And mm. I thought this was like a big deal. This is going to, we're going to drive a bunch of growth. We're going to have a, uh, we're going to have a better city at the end of this. And then it gets the planning commission and it's just a boring, unanimous <laughs> vote. <laughs> Like nobody brought balloons, champagne, confetti. It was, it was, it was, it was insanely bureaucratic. This gigantic decision was basically like all those in favor, aye, those opposed, motion passes. How many were in the gallery? I mean, just I don't even remember. I mean, we you we don't have many, right? Like we'll make you have 75. If we have, five, if we have five people showing up, if we have more than five people showing up, we're in for a long night. Like that's a big public hearing. That's what I'm saying. So we, wow. We you so know, in the history, in the totally history, unremarkable. in the history of these tectonic shifts in planning and the, the parking requirements yeah. being one that's really taken yeah. hold the last four years and you guys being the first, yeah. I think we should mark that. It yeah. was just a simple, it's just a quiet. simple vote. And then we moved on. I really. Go ahead. You probably oh, have then we just, better we, to just say. we just moved on to the next issue. Like it was like we were proving a side yard setback variance. Or something. It just was not. It was nothing. We're going to inspire um, a lot of new professionals on this one, right? Well, yeah, okay. You know, yeah. I, I think what you ought to do, Nate, is propose <laughs> something. Apparently, and I've not been here, but apparently in Euclid, Ohio, there's some sort of a plaque that commemorates the first <laughs> oh, zoning sure. code challenge to the Constitution. A planning I think historical that, monument. Totally. <laughs> Go into the parking lot at City Hall and just totally mark out one parking spot and say, yeah. "City, the city of St. Paul says no to that yeah. parking spot. Yeah. Here, here yeah. marks the spot and the first domino yeah. in America." But we don't. And then we have Donald really... Shoop just jumps out of the corner and goes, "Yeah, awesome. <laughs> been working on this for sixty years." <laughs> but we okay. haven't had too many memorable ones. I mean, when we were. We're back in person. We've been back in person for a little over a year. When we were virtual, it was easy to get lazy during public hearings, right? right, right? Because right. you'll have, we had a golf course on the other side of town from where I live that was going to be redeveloped and there was a big zoning issue around it. And man, I just, like, I could not care less about what, what it, it would have been such a long process, right? You're looking at five to six years of planning where we're involved and then the public hearing on it is like right at the end and it's just two hours. It's just two hours of everybody saying the same thing. Um, probably my worst planning commissioner moment is during that, I threw it onto my phone, put on my headphones, ran to Trader Joe's, <laughs> did a shop and got back before the end of nice. the year. That was, Very nice. That was, that was easily my worst moment as a planning commissioner. I know I should really, <laughs> I should really pay more attention. But I mean, there's only, I mean, if you've got one hour to hear people talk about how there's too much traffic, too many trees, and this is at the point <laughs> where trees. there are too, too many trees being removed or they're not oh. going to plant enough trees. Um, by the way, it's, it used to be a golf course, you know, it's, mm. a, it's a bankrupt golf course. So uh, anyways, you can, you, you only hear the same arguments for two hours, you know, you might as well make good time of it <laughs> I mean, let's get a little yeah, errand I, done here and there. I, I know that my my second go around was in the midst of COVID as well and thinking yeah. about the the distance you know via zoom and yeah. kind of 
frantically reminding myself, you better mute or you're going to have one of those naked gun moments. Yeah. If you recall the movie where he went into the bathroom yeah. and you're like the whole world knows yeah. what's going on. Like, dang it. So Nate, well, I got a question for you. At least here. Nate was um, able to down a bottle of two buck Chuck in the process. Yeah, right. so I think that's what he just said. Yeah. I think that's what I heard. Um, tell me a little bit, what advice now that you've been doing this for a while and as a practicing planner, you know, what advice would you give to a planner who's in charge of P and Z type hearings? Yeah, educate your commissioners and make it really clear on what they're voting on. Just, I know this touches back on what we talked about before, but make it very clear that, that we are voting on this one specific variance that could be a, you know, a seven foot height variance. So what your opinions on the massing of the building, completely irrelevant, right? You're <laughs> Right. You know, how ugly or how beautiful you think the building is, that is irrelevant. We're, we're looking at one specific issue. Right. And uh, really, you just got to got to stay on topic that. And, um, you know, I'm sorry that uh, planners running that have to have to write the staff reports, staff reports that they do. I mean, I'm glad that I can work professionally as a planner and I can say, thankfully, I've written very few of them. It's one of those things. It's like if you hated writing, which I think most in our latest generations do, and then you come yeah. into this profession and yeah, here, pound out this 38 page staff report by next yeah. week so we can get it in the yeah. agenda. I mean, that's yeah. that's paying your dues, right? Yeah. Oh, gosh, I've written a lot of staff reports, but I always I was in favor of brevity. I think that's the you know, isn't that like the. Um, evidence yeah. of genius or something. Anyway, so we're yeah. talking a lot about kind of these things, kind of do's and don'ts and hot tips here to, in our planning commission. What do you mm -hmm. think about, um, and what drives you crazy about public testimony, um, Nate? And and once you pull that string, maybe wrap it up with like, how, how what kind of advice can we give to our public to, to help us all out? <laughs> You know, usually by the time that somebody testifies at a at a development application or a zoning permit, it's it's generally too late, right? The planning work has been done. Mm -hmm. I think that what we need to do a better job on is that engagement on that front end plan mm -hmm. development, as opposed to being exclusively reactionary mm -hmm. in uh, taking each of these one by one, development by development. I think that's where it gets frustrating. That's why you hear as a planning commissioner, you, as far as testimony is concerned. You hear a lot of the same stuff every just from everybody, right? It's it, it's repetitive, mm -hmm. and we have to give everybody an opportunity to speak. They may only have two minutes to speak, uh, which they do in our city. Mm -hmm. But you can just have two again, minutes. Wow, you got two hours of people saying the exact same thing, and um, it really doesn't further the conversation, and it doesn't help you as a planning commissioner make a better decision. And I think that's really mm -hmm. the fault. Occasionally. We had a great one recently. I was so excited about this NIMBY. <laughs> so they, uh, they found that in the Mississippi critical area watershed, there was a, there's a new apartment building. There was an eagle's nest potentially in one of the trees. <laughs> Being a protected animal, how do you view that as a planning commissioner? You're like, you know, I don't have state law in front of me, right? <laughs> this wasn't in the staff report. I know there are a lot of eagles in the area, so it's very plausible that there could be a bald eagle that lives there. In fact, it probably did, right? And did then they bring like a drone shot? Because that would have been amazing if they were like, yeah. I just want to use the screen for a moment. <laughs> they didn't, but the people who live in this neighborhood probably could have afforded a drone footage, so that's on them. Um, <laughs> they didn't want to run into the eagle. It was probably a... You know, and I was just... Uh, <laughs> Clearly, they were opposed to it, whether it was an eagle or something else, they would have they would have opposed this. But I thought it was good. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Uh, there's an eagle. And then you delay for two weeks. And then you learn all about eagles nests. That's know? right. So, <laughs> so I always like those like I like those oddballs, the just the, the random ones that get thrown out there, at least for entertainment value. And <laughs> that's the type of stuff that really as a commissioner, it keeps you on your toes. I like those <laughs> things you can't anticipate. I have this image of this really well-intended neighborhood group wanting to confirm yeah. an eagle nest with a drone, <laughs> setting the drone up and the eagle just, like, <laughs> gosh, dang it, right? Like, what did we do? Yeah. Um, yeah, between a mama and her eggs, that's what you did. <laughs> to, to your point, I know when I, when I first got in, they kind of told me, I was surprised to hear this advice from staff, to be honest. 
But they basically said, look, by the time it comes to public testimony, you should pretty much have your decision made. And I thought, Ooh. I'm pretty sure Ooh. that the public doesn't want to hear that. Yeah. Now, I get what they're saying because you should have read, you should have thought, you should have weighed all of the evidence. And especially yeah. as you get farther into it, you understand what the code <laughs> says, the legal standing. Yeah. But I know for me, I, I try to listen to the public uh, in particular to point out little details that maybe we missed and they do a good job. Maybe we're fortunate here that we have a good number of people who participate in that process, mm -hmm. but you know, I, I, I often, and I also try to thank yeah. the public because look, man, it ain't easy going up to a microphone and people sitting up yeah. on a dais and, and them having to have the courage, what they never have, never get a chance to do is speak yeah. publicly. Everyone's so, you know, <laughs> afraid of that. And it's just kind of a reminder, Hey man, first of all, thank you for your opinion, you know, and, and I yeah. try in my reasoning statement to at least acknowledge some <laughs> of the things that were said, you know, that's a lot yeah, of think, hubris to come out and say, have your mind made up because you're essentially yeah. going, the public doesn't have the ability to bring any new information or things that we might have missed. Sorry, Nate, I stepped on you there a little bit. No, I think you're right. I, I mean, I generally view most people with empathy, right? Yeah. We, we recently had a, a larger development that was going in a neighborhood that hasn't seen a lot of development and there were fears of displacement and gentrification. And while we didn't really have a legal any legal grounds on voting against this development it should have been by right um you, you have a lot of empathy for people who are kind of feel like they're losing control of their neighborhood right like that they don't feel like they're a place in their neighborhood and i think that we oftentimes as commissioners or planners laugh at, at the public and many of them well deserved right but i think you do have to go in there with a little bit of empathy and um, kind of understand where a lot of these people are coming from. In the case of the bald eagle's nest, which will eventually actually not go through the planning commission, but you know, it's, it's a small church, right? And that's going to be redeveloped into 93 apartments. It's probably going to be 50, 60 feet high. And that's a change for a lot of people, especially if they went to that church, you know, they're no longer going to be able to walk there anymore. There's no longer going to be that front. They had like a big front grassy area that was right on the Mississippi river People go out there, they could hang out, right? So that there is a sense of loss, although it wasn't like legally their space, right? That space was owned by the church, which eventually sold to the developer. Um, you know, they feel a sense of pride in that space. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, how do you how do you respond to something like yeah. that? I think it's well, a good question. I remember a bridge project that was um and out here in Boise, we've got a lot of raptors and there was a lot of concern about the habitat there. And then they built right. their nest on top of the crane that was used for the bridge construction itself. Right. So some of the irony there. Mm -hmm. So it's like we you, object, we're going to yes, do it right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so you're, you're sitting there on the dais, you have a decision before you and you got to go to that thing called the dreaded. Let's see if it's consistent with the comp plan. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. What can we as the planning profession do to make that a little less painful. Yeah, I think one of the one of the problems with our comp plan, and we, we had this like great huge um, uh, effort with tons of public engagement, and we really hit just every base, right? We just everything that you want a modern comp plan to say for a large or mid-sized American city like St. Paul, it's in there. Uh, it's also insanely vague. <laughs> and it's it's like you can either justify or not justify something based on the comp plan. The development that I brought up uh, where neighbors had fears of gentrification, you can make a compelling argument on either side that it met the comp plan and you would both be absolutely correct, right? So I think that one of the problems that we have with our comp plans is, well, one, first, first of all, we'll pass the comp plan that says that, hey, we want more density at transit nodes, but then the city will never go and upzone those corridors, right? So you've got this mismatch between what the comp plan says and what the zoning, what the law says. Yeah, if we don't change the policies, the comp plan is is virtually yeah. meaningless in those arenas, right? Like yeah, so, so number one pet peeve is, why didn't we go fix the code as soon as we were done with the comp plan? Yeah, absolutely. And they take it slow. I mean, we're still working, trying to do code updates from our 2030 plan, which I think is like 12, to 15 years old at this point, right? So I think that lag creates a lot of heartache for planners too, 
Um, but yeah, just, just, I think our comp plans right now are too vague. Um, at least, at least how I see them, at least how they're oftentimes done in uh, the Twin Cities Metro and a few other places that I've seen. They're so vague that, you know, the more fuzzy language you use, like neighborhood character or <laughs> promote equity, I mean, those mean two totally different things to two totally different people who are looking at it. So I think really the devil's in the detail. So that's, so we were, you know, just talking about how a comp plan could be a little better there, you know, kind of the way that we can connect those better, but um, do you have anything like if you, if you kind of had that magic wand over the planning uh, profession, what, what would you make better? What would you shift? Um, there's a lot of conversation and thought leadership around planning is changing. What do you yeah. see there? I think that we micromanage as planners, we have a tendency to micromanage mm -hmm. too much and we try to get ahead of problems. And we try to anticipate what those problems are and prevent them. I, I think one example in St. Paul, Minnesota would be short-term rental Airbnb regulations. Mm. Uh, we spent a lot of time and heartache trying to figure out what's the best policy. But, you know, at the end of the day, we've got like 110 Airbnbs in a city with 110,000 housing units. Like it's just yeah. such a drop in the bucket. Now, oh. certainly <laughs> some neighborhoods are more impacted than others, mm -hmm. but this is clearly not a problem from yeah. the perspective of St. Paul, Minnesota. Certainly if you're a vacation destination in a small community in Florida mm -hmm. or California, it's going to be a different issue. But as far as we're concerned, man, we spent a lot of time trying to regulate and make uh, things much, much more complex for what ultimately turned out to be roughly a hundred, you know, <laughs> one bedroom apartments and buildings that are for rent, right? So I think that we have a tendency to micromanage. And I think we see that, we saw that with parking regulations, which we've now removed, but I think we're almost kind of making the same mistake in how we're trying to now micromanage things like bike parking, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a cyclist, Minnesota, so I'm a, I'm a summer fall uh, bike commuter. Uh, I'm not a winter cyclist, but we have, we have bike parking regulations where kind of where the parking garage used to be, we'll have these large rooms of bike parking, but you walk through downtown Minneapolis and you can just look in there and you just see these rooms are absolutely empty. And mm -hmm. the reason is people, if, if anybody has a really nice bike, they bring it up to their apartment, yeah. they bring it up to their <laughs> condo, they put it on their balcony. They don't want it in a shared area where you have 2000 pedestrians walking by looking through that door every day right mm. so we're not really thoughtful on that and we've used things like bike parking as like a checkbox as well too and i think we're making that kind of same mistake so we're creating in buildings a lot of extra essentially unused space so um i think bike parking facilities are great they're not often done well mm -hmm. um, but i don't think that us trying to go and tinker and try to micromanage those things at just such a nuanced level is really helping much especially when Let's be honest, you know, if your bike's over like 250 bucks, you're just bringing it up to your apartment. You're not, you know, you're not going to roll the dice with locking it into a hallway in a building with a hundred other people. So. Well, and your, your statement about comp plans, it's like, oh man, Don has <laughs> been hearing me say this forever. It's like one person's economic development is another person's mattress store or check yeah, cash. Yeah, yeah. Like that's not <laughs> what we're trying to say, but Somebody easily could come. Well, look, there's three jobs that came here, and you know, mm -hmm. on and on and on. For and your like, favorite horizontal mixed use. Yeah. Oh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's we, we call write... that a mix of uses. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. what they say now. It's not mixed use; it's mix of uses. Oh goodness. And we're about to do an episode here soon on consulting, <laughs> and so you can see where I'm going with this. Because look, there mm -hmm. are some consultants who write some pretty good comp plans, and there's others who write biblical. You know, <laughs> 500 page epic <laughs> type of journeys where it's like if whatever you want man we got it we got you <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. document yeah. and you're kind of going well what good does this do me yeah. if it doesn't actually say anything and that's a, that's yeah. something else i want to get to is like you see these documents work toward support well, what the hell does that mean what how are you doing those things you know and so your comp plan it man it's the same same situation give it to me in 30 pages Break it down by neighborhood. Tell me what you want to do. What's your, you know, very clear cut vision and call it a wrap yeah. because it's a guiding document anyway. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, so. But what the larger... about the existing conditions? Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what I was actually going to say um, existing. I'll tell you this from my job as a planner. 
man, I don't know how much money we spent on consultants writing up descriptions about what the existing conditions are when it's just, <laughs> it, it's so painfully clear. It's like, look, it's a four lane road, undivided roadway. What do you, you know, what do you want me to say? We don't need three pages on that, right? It's like crystal clear. Um, but everybody wants those existing conditions, right? Um, <laughs> my dream is instead of an existing conditions report is that we get everybody in like a bus where they all have a window seat right and then yeah. we just drive them around and you have mm-hmm. a driver and then you have like a tour guide and the yeah. tour guide stands up front and goes right now we're going down and they'll say the functional classification and the average daily traffic. Yeah. <laughs> and they're going to give you some facts like how many how many crashes are happening and you need here. that way away you got to start it with an energy drink because yeah. the hum oh, of yeah. that everybody bus, everybody's going to be five hours yeah. well, and, and 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 getting into that neck of the woods a little bit more you're kind of going wait wait also on your point to existing conditions <clears throat> show me a consultant who's going to take a $200,000 check to write a comp plan who describes that four lane road as crap and says, look, (laughs) it sucks. That's why we're developing this plan is because we need it to be better because they're so afraid to upset the apple cart, right? We can't do that. And, and, it, and so this, yeah. I think it misses the truth uh, yeah. of situation. I think you could say that in a meaningful way, but I hope that the cities who pay for these things yeah. also go, you know what? We need help. Can you help us? We need to be real, you know, and, and get to the point of this and make this plan and our zone, our zoning, you know, that much better. But- I don't know how many times I've been responding to an RFP where the city or or even right in an RFP where the city has said we want to completely change this area but preserve the neighborhood character right and it's like <laughs> you're hiring us specifically to change right, things right, right, right but you just got to preserve it like you just got to yeah. throw in that buzzword and uh hopefully notice nobody notices except you know the it, people who need to approve the a budget for this thing it reminds me of one in early in my career where a community was up in arms because they were redeveloping the kfc and the bucket had stuck so far in the air for so many years and it become an icon that that was the controversy mm-hmm. of over it was they're redoing the kfc they can't do the big bucket and oh my goodness we're messing up the character i love kfc i'm just gonna say that out loud i mean i know those potatoes probably aren't really potatoes but i like them anyway (laughs) i like that gravy stuff i don't know what that is the The gravy stuff the chickens don't have the chickens don't have beaks so i mean none of it's there chris beakless chickens well yeah and i I was just gonna say in the last few years i found myself writing cover letters for rfps and q's going you know essentially look (laughs) we're gonna do this if you want that don't hire me i'm not (laughs) gonna do that like no. I don't want the job. If that's what if you want the same old, same old, hire that group over there and they'll give it to you and we'll we'll all be better off for you know. Yeah. You know, and I wish for all planners to get to that place in their career where they can just go, listen, here's how I think you should do it. And if you don't like that, you yeah. really don't want exactly. to work this You know, exactly. well, do you want us to consult or do you want us to regurgitate policy? Well, we're getting too far into the consultant episode there. Uh-oh. Yeah, we're, hey, it's I'm gonna, I got to touch this. I got two stories. I used to, you know, I used to work as a consultant and I worked in transportation planning. We did a lot of traffic studies and data collection. I remember I was like meeting with the city and there were like nine buildings, they're all duplexes, 18 units. And the city's sitting here like, we got to do a traffic study. And I'm just sitting here like, yeah. like 18 units on like a road with just unbelievable capacity. <laughs> I want to say this isn't needed, but then I know in the back of my head, Christmas like, bonus, <laughs> that's a $15,000 contract right here. The right the bill. Right. We had the same thing too with a, with a, it was a third ring suburb. There was a, new single family home development that you know you just take it or leave it right and the the city engineer said this is like almost a direct quote i don't know if we need it but it'll be nice to have (laughs) end quote and i i was actually on one hand i was like i'm gonna make some money off this and then on the other hand i'm thinking i kind of feel bad for that developer even if it's like a large developer like this is they're just making them waste twenty thousand right. dollars so they can just have like a, a checkbox and, and when we're all crunched for housing affordability yeah, every little bit saying. counts and i it's funny because i posted this <laughs> poem on <laughs> facebook a couple of weeks ago i i do not think that i shall see an expenditure as worthless as a traffic study yeah it's just sums it up that was a good limerick it really so, was 
Nate, I yeah. think you're, 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 yeah, this is why we had you on. Cause I think we're, we're speaking the same language. So I want to ask you one more quick question before we turn it over <laughs> the lightning round, but as a stand up comedian as your night job, when you want to be derelict in your dad duties, um, yeah. I got it <laughs> when you need a break and honey, I got a gig tonight. Right? I got to get to the chuckle <laughs> hut. It's, it's, it's <laughs> calling. That's, that's super convenient. Well played. Yeah. I like that. Nate. Um, but I'm, t- I'm curious, how has your, how has your time as a commissioner helped your stand up or your stand up yeah. helped you being a commissioner? You know, uh, it's, it's all about public speaking. And I feel since I've, since I've, you know, been on the planning commission and do comedy. I just, if you can stand up in front of a group of strangers for three to five minutes and just tell jokes that you thought of the week prior, you know, you can definitely like tell somebody who's opposing that conditional use permit that they don't know what they're talking about. Right. So it really, like, it really does help build that confidence. I also think good stand up comedy, in my opinion, it, it's storytelling with jokes. Yeah. And I think as a planner, just going day to day, you got to tell a story because every little area has a story. And I know it's it's cheesy to say now, like tell a story, but um, I think it's really helped me. And I think it's for me personally, I've always told jokes to kind of ease the tension in a room. I feel like they can bring people together. You can bring you can bring everybody together with a good joke. And when when there's moments that are tense on the planning commission, I feel I feel like I can, I can cut a joke occasionally when appropriate and also when inappropriate. Uh, our <laughs> planning commission favorite. meetings are early in the morning, so I don't think a lot of people prepare for it, but <laughs> I feel like it can, it can bring people together in a tense situation. And um, I think all good jokes have empathy. I know that's kind of been something that I've said, all good jokes have empathy and understanding. Mm-hmm. And I think that's kind of what we need more in and planning commissions, right? Is empathy and then understanding. Hundred percent. We 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 oftentimes are are forced to make a decision of yes or no, and that decision is going to impact somebody's life in some way, right? There's mm-hmm. no there's oftentimes no middle ground, and I, I think it can kind of bring people together. So I think it makes me a a, a stronger commissioner, and, and it's going to impact their lives a lot quicker than federal policy and state policy and the things we absolutely. get worked up. That decision you're making as a P and Z commissioner can be affecting somebody in a matter yeah. of weeks, right? Yeah, I remember my first zoning experience. I uh, I wrote for my high school newspaper, and I got away with a lot in high school. But probably the most absurd was when they um, let me write a review for a strip club. <laughs> and it wasn't like a normal strip club. Wait, it was, a was sh- there field work involved? Right. Yeah. Right. Here's your <laughs> stipend. Was there a stipend? Oh my you god. Know, I was only 16. In ones. This um this was a strip club for teens. It was a 16 plus strip club. <laughs> it was pretty messed up. Uh it was pretty messed up. But if you were a 16 year old boy, it was the greatest thing on the planet. You know? Uh it was it was in a small town. Oh my god. It was in this small town called uh yeah yeah sorry i'll give you i'll give you a second there compose ourselves i say you I, well they had a fifteen thousand dollar traffic study done i bet yeah, yeah uh, absolutely yeah. you know they um they this company was setting up shop in these small towns around where i grew up this one happened to be in nicollet minnesota i think the population is like 807 or something like that <laughs> and they were setting up in these small towns specifically because they lacked sophisticated zoning codes that said things like don't build kitty bars next to schools you know (laughs) like they just didn't have these cities had no zoning right because these cities probably hadn't seen a new development in you know 20 30 years it was just the idea that a strip club would relocate there was just something that nobody had ever thought of right um so they really got bested on like a city planning loophole and man like me as a 16 year old journalist needed to do research (laughs) So like, this is like 2002, like set the stage. Like I'm wearing cargo shorts, pop collar shirt. <laughs> I was looking good, you know? <laughs> Me and my buddy, Tom, I don't have a car at the time. We take his 2002 uh, bright red Jetta to oh, this like, strip club, which I didn't even think about it at the time, but that was a flashy car back in the day. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. And I didn't think about it until later, but um. It was probably too fancy when we drove up for a town that's, <laughs> that's biggest employer is a butcher shop. You know, like we just like 
we're the oh, big kids God. from the town of 30,000 people. Um, so outside there were like protesters, you know, we, it was originally pinned as like a freedom of speech issue. And what I realized is like, that's not what it was. It was, it ultimately was a zoning issue. Right. And that was my introduction, just writing that article as a 16 year old journalist going to a strip club for teens, uh, about zoning. And that's what it was about. And that was my first foray into zoning. Uh, so there you go. That's my, I, that's my I, I just love, <laughs> was I it love your first you foray were... into a strip club? Dude, and the interesting thing is like that that made national news and international news like you can still look it up today uh like the new york <laughs> post new york times have articles on it just search strip club welcome school children and you'll see it and uh oh i brought i gotta be careful in that search engine that's good yeah don't do it on trouble. your work computer don't do it on your work computer <laughs> um I, I like the fact that i'm in, in my mind i'm going so your your editor sent you on this story right? Gave you time, maybe budget. I don't know. And, and you came back and they're like, for real, your, your big takeaway was zoning. That would yeah. like this totally salacious situation. Yeah. And your report was, well, the C4 zoning code does not permit this. Yeah. Man. So. <laughs> yeah. The so crazy thing. Too is, so the city, so the city cracked down on it and what they did is they removed their liquor license. So they had the separated area. It's like, you know, if you're under 21, but here's the problem is a terrible business model because if you're an adult in a small town, the last person that you want to see when you go into like a strip club is just like a bunch of teenagers that you know from the local area. It's just like a bad business model. Or so something about zoning, stirring, stirring young men's souls or something. Yeah, is that right? I think that's the quote. So, but they still had like, once they got their liquor license revoked due to like some city licensing on the zoning, they still had like a two drink minimum. So when I went in there, I had to like buy <laughs> Dr. Pepper. I had to buy like two Dr. Peppers. And, and it was you were so... at the age of 16 going, this is not good, Dr. Pepper. This has been watered down. Like you were a <laughs> Dr. Pepper connoisseur at that age. Yeah. Dude, this place was so dead when we went in there. <laughs> there was literally one of the dancers was in the corner reading oh, the book, God. The Da Vinci Code. <laughs> she was in a strip club. It's like ludicrous is on the speakers. Well, she had a she's, book she's, report due the next day. Dude, she's <laughs> literally reading the book, The Da Vinci Code. Oh my God, that's horrible. And, um, you know, hats off to her. That was a great recommendation. I ended up reading that book and really enjoying <laughs> it. Yeah. All right. Well, on that cheerful note, we're going to, I think we've already moved towards a lightning round a bit, but uh, we're going to finish up the last few minutes, Nate, and just kind of pepper you with a whole bunch of questions on nonsensical or somewhat sensical yeah, yeah. things. Um, my first question is, who are your comic or comedic influences? Right now, Nate Bergazzi oh, is yeah. one of the best. I love Nate Bergazzi. Um, I just can't get enough of his bits. I just listen I just listen to him over and over again. And that's really how um, I've kind of tried to model my delivery. So right now, Nate Bergazzi. Um, but there's a bunch of local people, guy by the name of Chad Daniels, uh, who's fantastic. If you don't know Chad Daniels, check him out. Uh, someone else, a uh, local guy here in the Twin Cities, Ali Sultan. He's fantastic. He's a he's an immigrant from Yemen, and hmm. man, he's got just so many so many great bits. I want a comedy tour in St. Paul. That's that's what I want for Christmas. Have you ever had to recuse yourself from a comedy club application? <laughs> Uh, no, I have not. <laughs> so of I'm all lucky the... to get any gigs. I'm lucky to get any gigs that I can. I, I turned down nothing. So between you having a five-year-old and uh, all the things you learn on planning commission, what's your favorite animal fact right now that you know? <laughs> Dude, I've been learning. We've been learning a ton about panda bears right now. And 90% of their diet is panda bears are crazy. 90% of their diet is bamboo. And the other 10 is rodents just like mm. what are you doing man they're like, savages wow, wow. I gotta maybe get it's an rodent. accidental rodent it's like on a yeah. stick of bamboo like and they're like well here there we must go. not be much <laughs> iron. there's not much iron in bamboo they gotta get I've, that I've, I've been learning a ton of new stuff about dinosaurs like i guess oh. a lot has changed in oh, dinosaur yeah. knowledge oh, since yeah. i was a kid yeah. and really? uh, I, lo I love these new dinosaur facts like what do you know that the t-rex right and the like brontosaurus which may not they're not even confident now as an actual dinosaur right it's actually a culmination of other dinosaurs kind of like pluto right it's not we're not sure not really yeah. A planet. <laughs> yeah so yeah. we like we i had this view that just dinosaurs just on the earth and they were everywhere and like that's not true you had certain type of dinosaurs that lived in certain type of climates and certain mm -hmm. geographies like the t-rex was 
like we view that as like a dinosaur that was pretty much just in the what is now the American West right it was nowhere else on the planet whereas other types of dinosaurs were on other different continents and so forth I thought that was really interesting I just think of them as a big chicken like Fun I think fact. the T-Rexes yeah. were actually just huge chicken with teeth yeah, yeah. that's that's what I see so let's you put might, that out there. Might, I can, you know, I'll I'll go into my daughter's room and I'll send you some good dinosaur resources. That, <laughs> there we very go. Very good, easy dinosaurs. reads. Will the Vikings ever get back to the Super Bowl? <laughs> I don't think so. Why is there always a sports ball question? That's because sports ball, Jess, sports ball. She calls it sports ball, Nate. I'm going to apologize on behalf of it. <laughs> There's like billion dollar industries around the world, like World Cup, yeah. and this one calls them sports ball. <laughs> Yeah. They're all right. one to me. I think just let people enjoy things, you know. What's your geeky planner travel habit? Mm. Oh man, my wife like my wife like refuses to travel with me. <laughs> like we were recently we were recently in like uh, San Diego, and those have a six lane road, and then those just have sharrows on a forty five oh, mile yeah. an hour yeah, road. Good, just, yeah. And I'll I'll just be like. I'd never bike on this road with kids. And she'd be like, Nate, just stop talking about Sharrows. Right. <laughs> Usually if I visit a new place, I'm criticizing the Sharrows. Um, <laughs> this is, this is my response on Sharrows. Big thumbs down. Yeah, it's just, yeah. Well, we've talked about informing planning schools across the nation that they need to create a course on how to travel and be a planner at the same time. Ooh, yes. Because we're yeah. we we all suck at it because we can't stop looking <laughs> at the things that yeah. we look at, right? Yeah. Like, there's the Eiffel Tower. I don't know. Have you seen the bathroom entrance over there? It's, yeah. it's like a little weird <laughs> yeah. step thing. I think that's more than a quarter. <laughs> yeah, I so think ever, that's ever have you ever worked Richard Pryor into one of your uh, commission meetings? Oh, man. I, you know, I haven't quite gone down that. Um, <laughs> I'm looking to keep the seat, you know. <laughs> you try wise. to do some good in the future as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What's your go-to restaurant and what are you ordering? You know, I, you know, I, I like to get breakfast with my daughter and her favorite yeah. restaurant is Panera. Uh, she doesn't uh, have very uh, refined taste at five, <laughs> but we find ourselves popping in there. We got a little local neighborhood walkable Panera, which I think not many people can say. So we uh, we'll head in there often and get like a pastry before school. So that's my go to restaurant just because I'm forming those memories with uh, uh, with my daddy daughter, daughter date, man. I got to do this. Yeah. I do the same thing. Right? You know? <laughs> fun stuff. So. Cool. Any other questions before we uh, wrap this episode up? I mean, so, Nate, do you have any questions for us? <laughs> what are people going to have to spend to properly do the whiskey pairing with this episode? Ooh, Ooh. I don't. I mean, That's, like I said, it's the retail, steepest one we've had. Yeah, yeah. retail. We don't even say, own it. <laughs> Yeah, retail was 600, but that's if you can even find it. So I was seeing all the way up to like three grand, four grand, believe it or not. And uh, and like I said, they're trying to encourage you to buy all nine, the collector yeah. set, just like baseball yeah. cards back when you were a kid. Like, yeah, yeah. okay. It's sure. the opposite end of when I did the Jack Daniels fire. So yeah, here's go. my suggestion since y'all didn't buy your aicp this year like i like a, you know this responsible <laughs> oh, plan over here did yes, yes, you yes. can take that 700 dollars yeah and go buy that whiskey for us <laughs> that is a much better use of said funds in my opinion <laughs> i think both will make you delusional when you buy it but um you know i like the end result of the, the whiskey oh. anyway all right well we're going to call that an episode. Nate Hood, Planning Commissioner from St. Paul, Minnesota. We thank you for being on the Planning Commission podcast with us. Um, all right. Reminder, our audience, visit our website, www.theplanningcommissionpodcast.com. With that, <laughs> commissioners, I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All right. Thank you all. Appreciate it. We'll keep doing our thing. and We'll see you next time. Hey, everybody. Commissioner Danley here. Would you like to see more? Hear more? Well, we got you covered. Go to our website, www.theplanningcommissionpodcast.com. It's got everything you want. Guests, yep, past episodes, the video, the audio, even our whiskey pairing. Links to everything about all the people we've had on. Books, websites, you name it. It's unbelievable. If you want to reach out to us, please. We'd be more than happy to chat. You can email us, planningcommissionpodcast at gmail.com. You want to tweet at us? Go for it, at planningcommish. We're also on YouTube. 
with the Planning Commission podcast channel, Facebook. Heck, send us a carrier pigeon if you need to. We'd love to hear from you about ideas, guests, you name it. Thank you for listening. We appreciate it. We'll keep doing our thing. You keep doing yours. Have a good one.